Good morning. If a person invites you to explain Agni Yoga, tell them that it is a path of striving to break your limitations. If that person should ask you, well, how do you break your limitations? You can say through observation and hard work. So Agni Yoga is a little over a hundred years old now. Agni Yoga will continue through you, through us, through our practice, through our life examples, and through our legacy. Today's Sunday talk is about Agni Yoga and the self, the uppercase self. The practice of Agni Yoga leads us to this uppercase self. We have many selves, but only one self. Through the science of observation, we will be able to discover if we are traveling toward the self or away from the self. So you're understanding the difference between the lower selves and the uppercase, you know what I mean by uppercase self? Okay, so I don't have to keep saying uppercase, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that people are going to slowly realize that the pure self in the universe is what we call the life principle. The pure self in the universe is the life principle. It manifests in seven cosmic planes, seven cosmic planes. In the cosmic physical plane, the lowest plane of the seven cosmic planes, it manifests in seven branches. This life principle manifests in seven branches through the cosmic physical plane. There is a physical life, emotional, mental, intuitional, atmic, and monadic life. Those are the seven branches. None of these, this is really shocking, but very important to know that none of these life currents are permanent. None of them are permanent. When the life current withdraws, to the center, withdraws to the center, and that can be different things according to you know your understanding of the teaching, but overall, when the life current withdraws to the center, the form on the plane where the life f is working disintegrates. Life is only in the universal life. So we were talking about the, this morning, the spark within the greater spark. Life is only in the universal life. And those who are one with the universal life are immortal. So life can depart from any of our vehicles any part of the cosmic physical plane, and when it does, it can leave it, that plane, in chaos and disintegration. But the life that exists within each atom and each cell is still a part of the Father's life, the universal life. This life is energized when the vehicles, when our vehicles are healthy. And it's not just our, our individual vehicles, it's also the vehicles of the planet. This life is energized when the vehicles are healthy. If not, if they're not healthy, then you know what happens, is the organism disintegrates and eventually the life in the atoms 
is withdrawn to the life source. The life lives through all that exists. Remember the seven branches, right? Lives through all that exists, building, sustaining all of its vehicles and destroying them if the forms are inadequate to make the life flow and flourish through them. That's why we want to take care of our planet. Not just our own bodies, but the body of the planet. So there is only one life, and that life is the law. In all its parts and levels, it creates branch laws. That's so what's so beautiful about this teaching. It's, you know, it's not, how can I say it? It's like people like things in black and white. They really like the structure and the form, and, and that's the way it is. But the teaching is like an unfolding flower. It's so beautiful. And it helps us to recognize infinity when we see that, that this law in all its parts and levels creates branch laws, the purposes of which are to make all forms, all levels and then come in harmony with the law. So that's what we're working on. The whole process of life is to come into harmony with life, with this law of life. Life is law. Life is always conscious. But this consciousness is relative. On every level, life is conscious according to the need of that life form. The whole existence is conscious in various degrees. The more life you have, the more conscious you are. The more life you have, the more conscious you are. The further we travel, there's so much in this, I hope you take some time out later in the week, go to our YouTube account, click on this particular video and take notes if you can. It's so deep, it's so deep. And, and But the beautiful thing about taking notes and listening two or three times is that you begin to understand. And the more you understand this whole life principle and the uppercase self, the more excited you're going to be and appreciative of life itself, your life, the life that's in form, the more appreciative you'll be and the more you'll understand the teaching. Now, the further we travel away from the self, the further we travel away from the self, away from the self, we lose our sense of who we really are. The times we travel toward the self, we are leaving behind pain and suffering. When we travel away from the self, we are choosing pain, suffering, and death. Those who travel toward the self become the masters of the universe, the heroes of the universe. And this is why it's so beautiful to read about heroes in our childhood, or if we're grandparents, read about heroes to your grandchildren and so forth. And if you're an adult, just think about the masters. Try to learn about their different lifetimes. We have known initiates of masters, read about their lives, their bios, and see how they are going, they are traveling. Their journey is taking them to that uppercase self. They are our heroes. There is the self and then there are the selves. These are the two ends of the same stick. The self, uppercase, Self is the root. The selves 
lowercase are the branches, the leaves. So we have the uppercase and the lowercase, right? We have the stick, which is the root, and then we have the branches and the leaves. We travel between the self and the selves. As we go down to the level of selves, we think the whole and everything in the whole exists just for us. As we climb toward the self, the sense of responsibility gets bright and clear within our heart. As we go down to the selves, then the sense of responsibility fades away. So it is a matter of where we stand on the path. The self is the pole star of our life that leads us to a life that's higher and higher into greater light. There are seven powers of the self. These seven powers are the powers that are used by the Agni Yogi. The powers of concentration the powers of synthesis, silence, patience, balance, the urge for enlightenment, the urge to expand our consciousness on the higher and lower planes simultaneously. Think about that, simultaneously to expand our consciously consciousness and then to our urge to freedom. To be able to renounce the separate selves, the selves that lead us into the greater pain and suffering. When a person is traveling toward the North Star, toward that self, they are striving to become one with the universe, one with the planets. Think of the astronauts, think of that opportunity. And we know John Glenn certainly did think that way. And he actually, he established an organization called IONS when he came back to help bring people into the realization of this self, even though we didn't call it that. Striving to be one with the universe, one with the planets, the sun and galaxies. They are using these seven powers in their travels toward the self. Since as far back as 1975 and later the year 2000, there are people, both young and old, who have been awakening to a greater reality. They are discovering that their physical body is just simply a garment for the soul. They're, <clears throat> they're learning that they can consciously withdraw from that body and have continuity of consciousness. They're learning to overcome matter and to lead themselves into right living and rational thinking, rational thinking. These are people who are striving on the path of Agni Yoga. They're trying to unify their many selves in the one self. They have a sense that they are not their physical body, they are not their emotions, they are not their minds. And they are something greater. And that something greater is the self. It is so clever if you train yourself in the science of observation and you become an expert in this science. It is almost humorous to experience the emotions over here that are feeling this and that and the mind over here thinking this and that and the two thises and the two thats are nowhere together. Sometimes that nowhere together is very very subtle, sometimes it's blatant but either way, it creates a friction and a chaos in your behavior 
and in your nervous system. So we are trying to unify these many selves with the one self to get away from pain and suffering and the sense of your life situation making you a victim. When a person travels away from the self, they are working against their survival, against that law, that life is law, law is life. To live a spiritual life means to survive. It means right living and, like I said, rational thinking. Now, the self is a fire that's found within each atom, cell, and person. The self is the fire. Agni Yoga teaches us how to release this fire and how to join the self of the universe. We could talk about the cosmic magnet here, but I'll, I won't, but I'll just bring it in to think about the cosmic magnet and the self, this uppercase self, the relationship, and how the magnetism of the cosmic magnet, once we are in harmony with this universal law, begins to draw us to it. In other words, we're not on our own in our striving. We're striving together. And this is why I said Agni Yoga will continue through you, through us, through our practice, and through our legacy. We're not on an island living life that's separate from any everybody else. It is, once you begin to not just know it, but to recognize it, feel it, and then experience it. You see this flow of life that is headed toward the cosmic magnet, headed toward this uppercase self that is so exciting and so adventurous and so beautiful and so extraordinary that you will begin to disassociate yourself from your sense of being a victim of your life and your life situations. I hope that makes sense. The self is sometimes called the awareness unit. The awareness unit must release himself from the physical, emotional, and mental atoms so that he becomes a unified field of fire. And this is what synthesis is. With this information, we can understand that Agni fire moves from the higher to the lower bodies. For example, you say that you are a very spiritually advanced person, a real self. Everything you do and say will be united with the fire of the universe and awaken the fire within others. When the fire is awakened in others, this is going, see the whole regeneration process from on high coming into the denser, going from the denser into the more refined. When the fire is awakened in others, they become one with you. That's the beauty. If you see someone living on an island, they are not, metaphorically speaking, they are not with you. They are living in their victim consciousness. When the fire is awakened in others, they become one with you and with all those who are releasing their divinity. There is no separation. They are part of the unbroken circle. Isn't that beautiful? We are told that there are higher beings 
who are trying to release the fire in us so that, see the higher coming into the Lord? Thank you, God. <laughs> These higher beings who are trying to release the fire in us so that we can graduate into a higher spiral of evolution. We, in turn, are trying to help the kingdoms below us. We are all like instruments in a big orchestra. Each has its function, and the beauty of the whole is related to the beauty of the parts. All the universe, all the cosmos is related. We must hasten our steps on the path if we want to eventually be graduated from this school of this planetary experience instead of falling into the abyss of pain and suffering. There is an Agni Yoga verse in the book Hierarchy that says, Maitreya wishes to hasten all. Maitreya wishes that all should be successfully accomplished. We are to being told to make haste, don't delay. The esoteric teaching tells us our planet is late on the path of its evolution. The delays are mounting. Look at our pollution. Look at our crime. Look at the recent political corruption. Then we can understand why we are being told that we are late. Maitreya is translated as the loving one. In the Himalayas, Christ is called the Maitreya. Maitreya wishes to hasten all. This is a teaching of inspiration. We are being inspired and impressed with the idea to transcend ourselves, to surpass ourselves, to observe and work hard on ourselves so that we can evolve. To live a spiritual life means to transcend our lower selves. It means to travel toward the one self, to ascend toward that self. It means to get hard on ourselves so we can evolve and release ourselves from this planetary school to graduate from planet Earth. Maitreya, can you imagine? It's just horrifying to me to think of having to come back and again and again as a little baby. Just, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not really into that. Um, so, <laughs> so, there are other ways to come back to this planet without having to become a baby again. We'll talk about that someday. But we have to be, you know, somewhat refined in order to do that. So Maitreya wishes that all should be successfully accomplished. The teacher is telling us that he blesses our striving, that he wishes for us all that the seed within each person, within each human being, will become a flower in the garden and bear fruit. When the Agni Yoga teachings talk about the garden, it is talking about the seeds found latent within each individual that have the potential to become a flower. The garden is made of disciples or beings of light and love and power. They are the flowers of the spiritual hierarchy. In each of us there is a plan. That plan was put there 18 million years ago, the teaching tells us, and must gradually manifest in its totality, that plan. This is the responsibility given to each of us, and it must be successfully accomplished. In order to successfully 
manifest our plan, we must find and then travel the spiritual road, the spiritual path. The verse in the book hierarchy also reads, Maitreya wishes you joy. Why is this? Because he knows that when we travel toward the self, when we hasten our evolution and complete the duties and responsibilities given to us as a soul, that's when we are going to transcend the pain and suffering in our lives and live in joy. So joy. Joy is a state of beingness in which our human soul builds an uninterrupted communication with the harmony of the higher worlds and radiates beauty and peace toward the world. That's joy, a state of beingness. The verse goes on to read, Maitreya wishes to grant to humanity the gift of the fiery experience of Agni Yoga. The Agni Yoga teachings has been published, have been published since 1922 and are now translated into more than, many more than 10 languages. I don't know how many, I just, 10 was the last number. But if you start, if you go to the Agni Yoga website, you'll see, you know, the, some of the translations are available on the agniyoga.org website. But there are many, many more translations that are not on that website. The Agni Yoga books are a treasury of wisdom that has no parallel in the esoteric literature of the world. We must read and assimilate them to bring us together and to be inspired with synthesis. You will find the word beauty repeated over and over again in the Agni Yoga teaching. A verse in the book, The Call, which is Leaves of Moria's Garden, Book One. It reads, repeat beauty again and again, even with tears until you reach your destiny. Agni Yoga believes that it is through beauty that we can go beyond our limitations. It does not mean repeating beauty mechanically. It does mean to create beauty in every action express beauty in each emotion, to demonstrate beauty in all thoughts, words, writings, and speech. It means when trouble comes to us, we can see beauty in the core of the trouble. That's very key <coughs> to helping us understand. We must see beauty in the core of the trouble of our situation. It means to see beauty even in our enemies, in the core of our enemy, there is beauty found. It means to see beauty in all that is until we reach the tower Shambhala. So let me return to the seven powers of the self with some explanation. Concentration, synthesis, silence, patience, balance, the urge for enlightenment, the urge to expand our consciousness on the higher and lower planes simultaneously, and the urge to freedom. To be able to renounce the separate selves, the selves that lead us into greater pain and suffering. Concentration, concentra to concentrate means to fasten our mind upon a particular subject or object, just like you're doing today, just when you're listening to this talk, that your mind hasn't wandered at all. Fasten your mind upon a particular subject or object without diverting your attention anywhere else. Actually, concentration is the first stage of meditation. Synthesis. Synthesis is the connecting phenomenon behind all appearance. 
The dividing walls of synthesis are our maya, glamours, and illusions. Synthesis emerges as we direct our lower self toward the way of higher evolution, toward true north, toward our uppercase self. Synthesis cannot be created by our actions or efforts because synthesis permeates all of life. Synthesis permeates humankind, the planet, and the solar system. We cannot create a synthesis, for synthesis is all pervading. So how do we do this? Synthesis is the relationship of all parts to the whole. The signs of synthesis can be recognized in those people, groups, nations, and cultures who are pure, who have healthy um, physical, who are healthy physically, emotionally, and have healthy mental bodies, and who demonstrate goodwill and inclusiveness and right human relations. Those who have a sense of synthesis have courage and daring. They are inspired by beauty and freedom and unity and synthesis. They serve the self in others. Synthesis is the recognition of the one self in all life. It's the recognition of the one self in all life. The Buddha in Christ are examples of synthesis, not necessarily their followers. <laughs> yeah. I know, we'll get there one of these days. It is through the Buddha and the Christ, they radiate the teachings of the son of Shambhala. Meditation and service serve as a path towards synthesis, silence. When we hold our thoughts and emotions in silence, we can control the incoming influence of lower ideas and impressions and thoughts. Through silence, we can withdraw that awareness unit from the lower planes into spheres where there is no conflict only the harmony of the self. The fourth power is patience. Patience is the ability to work with the rhythms of nature. Work with the rhythms of nature. For example, in patience, we can work with the rhythm of the new and full moon energies. We can sensitively work with the spiritual energies of the sun as it transits through the constellations. Through patience, we will be able to work with our karma and the karma of others, to know when to answer a letter, a phone call, and when to implement certain decisions. The fifth power is balance. The Agni Yogi knows how to balance their life with the fire of beauty. They know how to balance their achievements with the infiniteness of the universe. So each achievement serves as a stone with which to build their temple. The Agni Yogi is neither extreme in their sorrow nor their joy. Their balance is the middle and balancing point. When in sorrow, they grieve through their heart and, though and through their heart, they feel the grief of the cosmic heart. Our heart, the cosmic heart. When the grief of the cosmic heart touches the Agni Yogi, they find purpose in grief. When the Agni Yogi is in joy, they are in contact with the self, the higher self, and through this contact, they have a glimpse 
of future joys. So each balancing step leads the Agni Yogi toward the self. The sixth power is the urge for enlightenment. Enlightenment is the urge and ability to expand our consciousness simultaneously on the higher and lower planes. See how balance is required for enlightenment. I cannot emphasize this enough because it's so missing, this element of understanding enlightenment as a necessity to expand our consciousness on all planes simultaneously. What happens is the ignorant but beautiful student who is striving, they will focus on one plane of consciousness and say, I am enlightened. But when, they, when you engage in conversation with them, you will see that this is not the case. How do you see it? Through bias. He, through opinionated opinions that are biased against the synthesis of life. In other words, they're missing an all-inclusiveness. So the sixth power is the urge for enlightenment. You cannot use your emotional body at the expense of your physical or mental body. You should not use the personality at the expense of the soul body. Each expansion needs to occur simultaneously. How is this accomplished? Well, the answer to this would be a lecture in itself. I can say this much. The urge for enlightenment can be accomplished through concentration, meditation, and contemplation. Enlightenment can be achieved by observation and hard work. It can be accomplished by breaking through our limitations to meet our true self. And number seven, the seventh power is the urge for freedom. The teaching tells us that freedom is not a physical condition, but a condition where we are not caged by any limitations and where the great ones can inspire us with great wisdom, enabling us to serve in significant fields of human endeavor. The failures of the universe are those who keep living for themselves, their little self, lowercase self. And let me close with this one sentence. Our journey will continue ad infinitum until the self manifests in his glory within all ourselves. So that's Agni Yoga and the self. <laughs>